All right. Good morning, everyone. So this is the fourth lecture uh, in mobile genomics course, projects and seminars at ETH Zurich. So for today, we'll uh, continue with the read mapping topic that we explained in the last week. For today, we will explain about one of our earliest work uh, called Gatekeeper. Uh, in the previous lecture, we covered different topics. You can find them already online in the course website, as you can see in the link down below. Uh, the lecture videos are all publicly available online, as you can see in the playlist. The slides are also available. Even the slides for today, you can see them as well over there in the schedule. So for today, we will cover a new paper called Gatekeeper that uh, uh, published in 2017. Uh, in this paper, it's a new hardware architecture for accelerating pre-alignment filtering in DNA short read mapping. And we will continue covering uh, different topics in read mapping for the following three to four weeks. And then we will move on to a new topic. Okay, so what is the executive summary? The problem is that genomic similarity measurement is a computational bottleneck, so it's really expensive. And we would like to solve this uh, expensive problem. And the thing or the challenge that we cannot replace it. So we cannot replace this expensive algorithm with something inexpensive. But rather, we can reduce the times we are using this expensive algorithm. So we observe that examining the similarity of high dissimilar genomic sequences and when I said high dissimilar, it means there are a lot of variations between the, the two sequences. And probably if there are a lot of differences, then this is not interesting for inferring the causes for disease, for example. It really depends on what kind of disease you are studying, what kind of genomic data you are using for the study and so on. However, there is always a threshold. So there is always a certain a number of errors that you can tolerate or you need to tolerate. And we leverage this information so that we said, whenever there are two sequences have too many differences exceeding that threshold, then let's not use this expensive algorithm for these particular type of uh, genomic sequences. So our goal is to develop a fast and effective filter that can tell us this kind of information, which is the number of edits exceeding a threshold or not. And this kind of filter can detect highly dissimilar genomic sequences and eliminate them before invoking this computationally expensive step. The key observation, if two strings differ by E edits, so if there are E number of edits between these two sequences, then every pairwise match can be aligned at most two E shifts, two E uh, operations of shift. That is at most, so you could use less or equal to this number. Uh, and uh, we use this to build a filter that is very quick uh, so that we quickly find similar sequences first using Hamming distance. So we apply Hamming distance and we see what are the number of differences. If they still exceed a threshold, we cannot say now whether it's really expensive or whether they are similar or dissimilar. So we need to continue with the second step. After Hamming distance, we compute shifted Hamming distance, which is a, 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 a version or a special case or a generalized, let's say, of Hamming distance for the rest of the sequence pairs. So we end all these uh, two E plus one Hamming vectors of the two string to identify the similar sequence. Now, if we find out that there are number of differences exceeding threshold, then we can make a, a, a very good decision saying that whether these are similar or dissimilar. But we cannot make such thing in the first step. In the first step, only you can say if they are similar or um, something else. We still cannot decide if they are dissimilar. Because in Hamming distance, we don't consider insertions and deletions. So if they are less than a threshold, then probably this is good. Then you can accept it directly, but you cannot reject in the first step yet. You need to apply the second step and then observe whether you can accept or reject. And both of these two steps, we apply them in FPGA. So since the operation of the entire algorithm is highly parallelizable, everything relies on bit parallel operation. So you can use any hardware platform because this is really hardware friendly uh, algorithm. 
uh, you have the option to use SIMD instructions as uh, published in an SSD paper, or you can use FPGA, you can use 3D stacked memory and so on. And the key results is really uh, very good. So providing a huge speed up of up to 130X compared to previous state of the art software, software solution. And of course, if you compare it to the state of the art software solution, you will find this speed up ratio is a bit lower than this because the software at that time were very low. We are talking about 2016, 2017 here. All right. So uh, the, the main term or the main um, uh, conclusion of this talk is that we need intelligent algorithms and intelligent architectures that handle data well. What does that mean? If you would like to reap the, the greatest benefit out of your algorithm, you need to implement it in hardware. And same thing, if you would like to get the highest benefits from your hardware, you need to design an algorithm that understands the hardware. Why is that? Because sometimes in the architecture, there are some instructions that can do the same thing that you are thinking to do, but very efficiently. So your algorithm should be aware about these uh, tricks in your hardware. And I'm going to show you example about the very specific FPGA we use in this design. And there are a reason why we choose that FPGA. Okay. There is another paper also summarizing all the acceleration efforts for genome analysis and with a major focus on read mapping. So we recommend everyone to have a look on it. All right, so hopefully from the previous lecture, we are all agree that sequence alignment is very expensive, which is the dynamic programming based step. And our goal is to accelerate that step or to accelerate read mapping ultimately or eventually. And as I said, sequence alignment cannot be replaced by something else. You really need to, to use it, even if it is expensive. But what you can do, you can smartly design something that can cluster the workload or the input data to that step, which is expensive. And by clustering, I mean, you can recognize sequences that have very high similarity above a threshold or sequences that have a number of variation less than a threshold. So what does that mean? We said genomic strings are two types, either similar or dissimilar. And this is based on a threshold again. And this threshold it really depends on the application or on the user to set this such a threshold. For dissimilar sequences, we said normally they are not interesting at all for the application, whatever the application. Since you set the threshold, then it means anything above this threshold is not interesting. There's no significant in knowing these differences. So we need to ignore these dissimilar sequences and not using the dynamic programming after all. However, for similar sequences, even if the threshold is five and our algorithm said there are four, if, even if the actual number of edits is two, for example, that's still fine. As long as your tool can say this is lower or above a threshold, that is fine. We don't care about the exact number of differences at this stage. This stage only for filtering. So as long as we provide correct decision, lower or above a threshold, that is perfectly fine. And that's why after filtering, we, need, we still need to use sequence alignment because sequence alignment can tell you the exact number of these differences and even the exact type of these differences along with the location of each of these differences. The type of differences can be insertions, deletions, or substitutions. You can replace character, you can delete, you can insert. And that mimic exactly the same effect we have it in disease. So as we explained in the previous lecture, some disease can be uh, uh, caused by alteration in your DNA. And that can be small or very large uh, alteration, either as insertion, deletions, or even replacing some characters. Okay, so the gatekeeper is basically a filter. Uh, so th that can tell you whether these uh, sequences have less, uh, have a number of differences that is less or above a threshold. So an ideal filter, we would like to have three properties and these three properties all together should be satisfied in any filter. The first one is we would like to filter out most of dissimilar sequences. And why I said most of, but not all of it, because this is a filter, right? If it is perfectly accurate and can tell us 
all the dissimilar sequences, then probably this is not a filter. This is a sequence aligner since it's 100% accurate. Uh, and that's why we are aiming to filter out most of the similar sequences. And it's okay to have some of them accepted or passing the filter because we are going to have in the third step here, sequence alignment that is 100% accurate. So even if you uh, pass some of the uh, incorrect ones or dissimilar sequences, you can still recover from this and delete them in the third step. The very important property is the second one preserve all similar sequences. If two genomic sequences have one edit, for example, or one difference, and then the threshold is five, you still need to pass this to the third step. And that is a must. Why is that? Because the aim of the entire read mapping process is to find these differences between the sequences. And if you delete some of them, it might affect the end results of read mapping. We don't know whether losing one read or few read might affect, but the, the keeping all of them is always the best. And the third property that is very important as well, we need to do this quickly because the goal of having the filter is to accelerate sequence alignment. But if filtering is taking most of the time or it really has a high overhead, then we are not going to get any benefits, right? Remember, the filter here is an additional step we added to the pipeline so that we can accelerate sequence alignment. You can still uh, ignore the filter and use sequence alignment directly, but that's going to take a lot of time, right? Okay, this is general overview about Gatekeeper. Gatekeeper, in that time when we proposed it, was the very first pre-alignment filter to be implemented on FPG or accelerated using hardware. And what we do, we have the sequencing over there, providing all these uh, genomic sequences, very short or long, but still not as long as a chromosome, for example. And we have the index, the hash table that tells us, okay, each location or each piece of this read might have similarity with the reference genome at this location, one, 10, 100, 1000, for example. So we go at each of these locations and try to fetch a segment that is equal to the length of the read or with a certain margin. So you can, if the read sequence is 100, for example, you go at location 1000 and you fetch 120 characters starting from location 1000 or even before that by some margin. Anyway, at least it should be the same length as uh, the, the uh, read itself. I think the camera is stopped. Yeah, I'm not sure if you can still see it. Okay, then you can switch to the laptop camera. Okay, I don't know why it uh, consumes a lot of bandwidth once I started. Maybe it's shared with Zoom. All right, so that's that's all for the full pipeline, how we integrate uh, the gatekeeper. We have it as a filter that take all these two sequences or sequence pairs, and then one, only the things accepted by the filter, we apply sequence alignment, and then we generate what we call cigar string. Okay, so let's see the algorithm behind gatekeeper. The key observation, if two strings differ by E edits, then every pairwise match can be aligned in at most two E shifts. And they have a nice example, so you can uh, see or understand these things in more details. The key idea, as we said, have applying first hamming distance, and then only if it is not accepted, then apply shifted hamming distance. And we use pit parallel operation over there uh, such as SIMD, FPJ, 3D stack memory, and AMBIT. Okay, now what does it mean to have two E shifts uh, that are enough to find any pairwise match? This, this is the example I mentioned. Imagine we have two exact match words, exactly as the same, Istanbul and Istanbul. We would like to match them together, just compare all characters or, or all pairwise characters. Then you have eight matches, right? And there we have no mismatch, but let's do the mismatch ourselves. So we'd like to delete this A from the second world. We delete the A, and since this is a, um, a single sentence altogether, then it will be this 
version. So remember, we deleted an A from here. And now when we do the exact matching between the two sequences, then you find out that there are five mismatches. So we have only three matches and five mismatches. Although we deleted just one character, we make one edit operation. So what is the cause for all this high number of mismatches? Is the deletion, right? Because we deleted one character from here, then all trailing characters from there are shifted by one step to the left side. So how we can solve this? One idea probably to shift this, these trailing characters to the right side, then we can do the comparison correctly, right? So here, what we'd like to have as a roundabout <coughs> or as a workaround uh, to this problem to solve it is to have a second version of the uh, modified uh, word, which is Istanbul without the A. Now we have the second one, but, sh but shifted to the right by one step. And then let's do the comparison. When we compare this to this, how many matches we got? We got three. But when we compare to the second version, we got four matches. Remember, these are still mismatches, the IST in the second version, because they are not aligned with the IST from the first uh, word. Now, we need to combine both results from both versions. So we have three here and we have four there. How we can do this uh, in algorithm or in hardware? So the match operation, we can do it directly using XOR, right? And now this is the XOR results. If you convert the match into zero, because uh, the, there is no differences. So in XOR operation, if the number of differences is odd number, then you always get one, right? But since here, they are always the uh, same number of uh, character, T and T, then that is even, not odd. That's why you got the zero over there. Now, what is the heuristic or what is the right operation to be used so that we can combine the zeros from there with the zeros from the second version? Yeah, let's wait for some suggestions. So the, the problem now, we want to collect the zeros from the two sequences. What kind of logic operation we should use to achieve that? We want to have the three zeros and the four zeros. Okay, perfect. So I see people in the chat. You can also enable your mic, make it more interactive. So we got three answers using and operation. Exactly. Uh, that is excellent. So we want to use the and operation to get the zeros from there. And this is what we apply over there. So and operation for the two results of the XOR, and this is what we got in the final output. Now let's count how many zeros, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And that is exactly the number of matches between the two versions, since we only make one deletions of the A character. And another observation that you can see that the one is located exactly where we deleted the A. If you remember, the A was there and we delete that, and that is the position where we have the alteration, right? So this give us two nice information. First, the number of differences, which is one only, and the location of that difference, which is one uh, or it's the fourth character over there. And that is a, a gatekeeper, or this is shifted hamming distance. So we have seven matches and one mismatch after all, and we fix the problem of not knowing or uh, shift uh, the effect of the uh, alteration we did. For example, if you delete a character, all the trailing character will be shifted to the left. And if you insert a character, all the trailing character will be shifted to the right, which is the opposite. Okay, now, since we do the deletion ourselves, so we already know that the effect, we need to cancel it by having something shifted to the right. But what if, we insert a character somewhere in Istanbul or in this sentence. What kind of shift operation we should apply to these version? Should we shift to the right? Should we shift to the left? Should we keep it as is? Now, remember, this is a deletion, so we shift to the right. Now, if we have insertion, we need to shift to the left. But what if we apply two operations? We apply a deletion and then an insertion somewhere randomly what we should do. 
any suggestions? No shift. But remember, the deletion will shift the trailing characters, and the insertion will shift also. So we need the shift anyway, right? Shift in both directions. Excellent. Yes, that is perfect. So we need to shift in both direction because the deletion, as I said, let me annotate probably. I'll choose blue color. So this is the, the sentence. If I delete this, if I delete the A again, all of these will be shifted by one step over there. Now, if I insert the character here, the trailing character, which is only the U and the L, will be shifted by one step over there to the right, right? So we need to have two versions to correct the two edits. We need to have one shifted to the right to fix the deletion and one shifted to the left to fix the insertion. Now you could observe that insertion after deletion or a deletion after insertion will fix the, the second trailing characters, which is these guys. The U and L will stay the same since we shift them to the left and then now we shift them to the right. So they will stay aligned with the U L from the second, word, uh, second sentence. So that's why maybe uh, some of you said no shift and that is uh, correct if you consider the U L but how about the N, B? N, B is, is, are still shifted to the left, right? So we need to correct for the N, B. That's why we need the shifted version. And this is exactly what we do in Gatekeeper, since we want to generalize this algorithm to any sequence. And also remember that we have no information about what kind of uh, alteration has been done to the sequence. So we don't know if there is insertion or deletion in advance. So that's why we need to have a fixed set of shifted uh, uh, versions to the uh, second sequence. Now let's see this in action or in real sequences. We got the question. I thought delete and insert at the same position. Yeah, that is also correct. So uh, as you observe, uh, deletion after insertion or insertion after deletion, they will cancel each other effect. But if there is a gap between the two operation, then you'll have a problem for the things in the middle, right? So that's why you need to consider this. And this is exactly what we were discussing. So if exact match, we have no problem. That's why we ha apply Hamming distance over here because Hamming distance is the fastest to tell us if these are exact match or not and you can count how many differences. Uh, imagine if there are even inserted character here in the last three character, for example. If there is insertion or deletion within this, the, the utmost you can get number of differences as three, right? This is the most you can get as three differences because the one operation over there will affect all the trailing character. Now, if you have two operations, shift and deletion, for example, they cancel each other, then you get less than three but you cannot get more than three differences. That's why still Hamming distance can work for insertion and deletion on only these special cases. That's why we uh, choose Hamming distance as the very first stage to check for exact matching and also to check for sequences that have low number of differences. Now, if Hamming distance accepted, or uh, if Hamming distance accepted, number of differences less than a threshold, then done we terminate the algorithm we stop it here however if there are too many differences we're still not sure if this is correct or not why because if there is an insertion here it will affect all the trailing character over there and then we will have very high number of differences unreasonable right so we just did one operation over there that's why we move on to the next step but we don't terminate the algorithm at this stage same thing with substitution. Still, all of these, uh, the two cases over here, the exact match and the substitution can be detected using only Hamming distance, right? Now, again, if uh, it did not pass Hamming distance, we move on to the shifted Hamming distance, which is over here. And you can see if there is an insertion at the red location over here, then all these will be shifted to the left and same thing over here, another, uh, another insertion, then all the trailing character will be shifted twice because the first one will affect these by one location 
And then now the new insertion will affect these by another shift operation. That's why now you can, uh, we can see where's the cursor. It's very difficult to see. to draw. Yeah, I lose the cursor when I use the drone. So for example, you can see the ACC is already shifted by two steps over here, right? That is because we have two insertion. The exact same thing for deletion, as you can observe over here. Do you have any question? This is very important to understand this algorithm. So everything uh, is smoothly understandable in the following slides. Let me know if you have any question. Yeah, I hope people can track also the questions on YouTube so we can take them during the class. All right, so that is the algorithm. And now for um, the implementation or how we really implement it on FPGA or on logic gates. So first, let's see a real example with real data. This is a real sequences from a human genome. And what we need to do, this is the Hamming distance calculation, just XOR between the two sequences. Uh, let me annotate it. So these two sequences, and we do first the Hamming distance calculation, just XOR between them, right? And you can see it's zero where they exactly match one where, where they don't match in the corresponding locations. Now, if they uh, don't pass the Hamming distance, we build these set of factors. How many of them? As we said, there are two E. What is E? E is the edit distance threshold. How many edits you want to tolerate? Three, four, five, six, right? This is set by the user. But normally, for most genomic studies, it's 5% uh, of the read length. So 5% of the sequence length. If this sequence is 100, then this is 5. So if E is equal to 5, then we need to build 2E, which is 10. 10 of these factor plus the Hamming distance factor, that is 11. So 2E plus 1, right? Now, the Hamming distance can be done using X or operation directly. But the others, we need to shift one of the two sequences, either the query or the reference, one of them, not both. One of them need to be shifted. For example, for deletion, since the effect is going to the left, we need to do the opposite. So we need to shift the sequence to the right and then do the comparison with the reference using X or. Now, the two deletion masks, we shift the query by two steps to the right, again, because this is to cancel the effect of deletion. And then we do the XOR with the reference. For the three deletion mask, we shift the query by three steps to the right, and then we compare it to the reference using XOR. Exact same thing, we apply it for the insertion mask, but we do the opposite effect. So we shift the query to the left, not to the right. You can always think about inserted character. If you insert a character, where all the trailing character will be shifted, to the right, right? So we need to do the shift here to the opposite, which is to the left. Hopefully this is not confusing. Now, assume we build all these factor, what we do, as all of you suggested, we should use and operation. Uh, again, I lost the cursor. Let's complete the drawing. So as you can see here, hopefully you still can see the cursor. Uh, the goal is to attract all these zeros, the segments of zeros, because always they are uh, representing the exact matches between the two sequences. So what does that mean to get two different sets of exact matches over two vectors? So we got matches over here and then matches over the other vector. It means since we got some matches on one deletion mask, it means there is one deleted character somewhere. And where's this location? Normally it should be at the exact location where we switch from one vector to another, which is uh, over here. Which is always around here. When we shift from one vector to the other, it means there is something that caused that effect, which is exactly here. As you can see, there is one deleted C from here that does not exist here. We have only single C, but here we have two Cs. Let me delete the notation so you can see it clearly here and here. 
right? So that is a nice thing coming from Gatekeeper where it can tell you the exact location of the operation plus the number of uh, operation that you apply. Okay. Yeah, it's a bit uh, hectic to deal with the annotation, but it's very nice to have it in the lecture. Maybe we should have an iPad. Okay, so now our goal is to track the diagonally consecutive matches, which are the green highlighted pieces. So we want to attract them and count them at somewhere, right? So let's do the end operation. Once we do the end operation between all these vectors, we got this result. Remember, you may not want to do the end operation if the Hamming distance calculation pass the, 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 the thing. If they uh, below a threshold, then you stop. You don't need to do uh, all these factors. However, when we do the end operation, we have a little problem here that whenever we have a zero somewhere, it will always dominate because we have end operation, remember? So it always dominates and cancel anyone. And remember these ones representing the differences between the two sequences. So if you have a zero that will cancel the ones, then you will have less number of ones. And that might cause what we call false positive or false accept. So you accept the wrong sequences. They have high number of differences, but because of the end operation, you underestimate these uh, numbers and then you accept these pairs. As you can see here, we got no ones, although there are two differences over here. As you can see, it is AA, or um, because there are deleted characters, so they are shifted a bit. So I think it's um, it's AA and AG. There is one difference that we should capture over there. And now what we do, we apply some heuristic. We said, okay, what are the causes for this domination? It is the number of zeros that are in parallel or overlap with the ones. So if there is a one here and we want to detect it, sometime we have zeros some, 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 somewhere here. Here, in this case, we don't have zeros. In this case, we don't have zeros, but here we have the zeros, right? And if we look at these zeros, normally they are short, like single zero, single zero. Maybe here we have a bunch of zeros. Uh, here, a single zero, right? So we said, okay, Let's try to switch them ourselves. Let's try to convert all these short segments of zeros into ones so that we can cancel the effect of these, uh, we call them random zeros in the vector. And this is the new version of these vectors. That is, we replace everything less than three uh, zeros. So which is one or two. Whenever we have single zero, just switch it into one. Here we have three zeros, we don't change it into anything. That's why we still get it over here. Uh, this zero, for example, we change it into one. As you can see here, you got a vectors that has less number of zeros or less number of random zeros. And then do the AND operation. Let's see what will happen. You got now the one over there that represent the differences. Of course, we still lose something because we don't replace all zeros. If we replace all zeros, then we will lose the exact matches, which are highlighted by green over there. And uh, as we said, if there are few number of errors, then always the uh, segments of consecutive zeros will be very long. As you can see here, this is maybe more than 10 zeros. This is more than 10 again. This is more than maybe 40 zeros. This is more than 15 zeros and so on, right? And this is how we differentiate between random zeros and zeros that are part of the solution or the, those who represent exact matches. So this is a sequence aligner. If you compare the results with the sequence aligner itself, you can see uh, that we almost there, almost identical solution to the sequence alignment, but we have one difference over there. And since uh, the, uh, we said there are two E of this vector, right? So E here is three, right? If you still remember, E is three and E is the added descent threshold. So how many ones over here is three, right? Since it's less than or equal the threshold, 
then this will be accepted. But if you look at the final solution by sequence alignment, one, two, three, four operation. Four operation exceeding the three, then this, these two sequences we said are dissimilar. So it will be accepted by our filter, but rejected by the sequence alignment. That's why we call it a false accept or false positive. And this is why we need still the sequence aligner to be there. Hopefully that answered a lot of questions about the algorithm. Still, uh, if you have any question, feel free to ask now. You can enable the microphone or send it in the chat. People on YouTube can still ask their question as well in the chat box next to the video. Okay, so now let's move on to the implementation. Now, how these operations are still more effective or less computationally expensive than sequence alignment. If you still remember from the previous lecture, we explained uh, the sequence alignment. So we said in the dynamic programming table, there are dependencies, right? So every cell you need to compute. Uh, let me indicate, let's use different color now. If you want to compute this cell, you need this cell, this cell, and this cell. So you need three preceding cells to calculate one single cell. And that's why you cannot do all of them in parallel. So you need one cell and then the next, and then the third, and then you can calculate the fourth, right? That's why we move that uh, row wise, for example, and then we reach this one, or you can do column wise. And then while we're moving here, then you can calculate this one and so on. There are multiple ways. There's anti-diagonal, there's a block shade and so on. However, in our calculation or in Gatekeeper, there is no dependencies at all. Why is that? Because you just compare the A with the C, A with the T, A with the A and so on. So everything is totally independent because when you shift this sequence, you shift it by one step and then you compare with the other sequence, that is totally independent. So you can do it in one operation in the FPJ, for example, or one SIMD register, you can load everything over there if it fits in 256 or in 512, depends on what kind of uh, SIMD lane you are using. If it fits, then you can do it in one cycle, right? Uh, because everything is independent and you can do it for all vectors together in parallel. So you can uh, do shifting to the right, shifting to the left, shifting by two steps to the right and so on. All of these still independent. And that is very nice feature or difference between the two algorithms, between sequence alignment and filtering. There is no dependencies here at all. As you can see from the algorithm, you just compare the corresponding character based on different indices and see if they are the same or not, where you can get zero or one, or you can, do the things we were explaining, shifting the entire sequence to the right and then do the comparison and so on. What is the benefit of not having any dependencies between these cells when you compute the entire mat matrix? So the nice thing that you can parallelize everything uh, using today's hardware. In, in, in sequence alignment, if you want to do the parallelization, what you can do is to solve many problems in parallel, right? So you replicate the, the, this module to calculate sequence alignment many times. So you have different pairs operating in parallel. However, in the gatekeeper, you can have every cell replicated or the, the module to calculate single cell or multiple cells can be replicated to parallelize uh, inside or inside the problem for solving two sequences. So you can have the parallelism at the level of sequences as well as at the level of the entries of the DP matrix. And this is where we got the 130X speed up, for example. All right, now how about the hardware acceleration or how we realize this algorithm in, in logic or in Verilog, for example. Uh, first, to generate the vectors, you need how many operations for the Hamming distance you need just the XOR, right? And how many of these XOR operations, assuming it's two to one, to input one output of the XOR gate, then how many of them you need? You need basically as uh, long as the sequence. Uh, so if the sequence length is 100, then you need 100 of these gates, right? So one character from one sequence, another character from the other sequence, and you got one bit out of this. Now for the, um, the shifted mask, the deletions and the insertion mask, you need a shift operation first, 
and then you can do the XOR, right? And it's up to you to leverage the shift operation you applied already earlier to the query. So once you shift it by one step and then you do the XOR, you can shift it again by one step to do the two deletion mask, right? So it's up to you to do this kind of optimization or you can do it totally independent of each other. So for example, you can shift again in the next step, the query by two steps, right? Or you can shift it by one gradually. It depends on which one will provide better throughput as well as a better uh, resource utilization. Now the challenge when you uh, change the bits, the short zeros, single zero or two zeros into ones, how you change them. Uh, we, we leverage the lookup table operation in FPJs. And we know that all FPJs have lookup table to, in order to achieve any kind of uh, logic operation, right? So you can, um, there are some logic gates exist in the slice of the FPJ, but there are always lookup table to do any kind of operation. And this lookup table normally they have uh, a fixed size, how many input you have to this lookup table. In today FPJ, it's around six to seven. In old FPJs, about two to three inputs. So you cannot apply any function uh, within a single slice that has more than three inputs, for example. So you need to use multiple slices or multiple lookup tables. For us, we were aiming to change only single zero or two zeros. So how many input we need for that lookup table? And this is a very important metric to choose the appropriate FPGA so that we don't uh, double the resource utilization. So if you use a number of inputs for the lookup table that is uh, less than or equal the number you have in the FPGA, then that is the ideal utilization you have for the FPGA resources. If you have more than that, then you directly double the number of lookup table, even if they are underutilized. So how many input we need? This is the important question now. So if you have a single zero or two zeros, you need to consider all cases or enumerate all sequences that consider one or two zeros or more. And for that, we need five input for uh, solving this problem efficiently. Why five? Why not six, not seven? So for single zero, it's easy to solve, right? So you can uh, check any occurrences of one, zero, one, that is three input lookup table, right? This is the easiest, which is single zero. Why we need one, zero, one? Why not one, zero, and then don't check this, for example, because this could be zero or it could be one. So now in order to be sure that this is a one, you really need to consider the three bits together. Now, when we have four, when we have two zeros, why not just considering this case? one, zero, zero, one, which is four input rather than five input. Now the problem, sometimes you don't really get the exact pattern as one, zero, zero, one. What you will get uh, something else, maybe uh, something, then one, zero, zero, and then that is the end of the four. So let me write it. Let me see where's the cursor. The cursor is here. Okay. Imagine this case you got zero, then one, and now we start counting zero, zero. And then you don't have anything to check because that is four bits. How about this case? Is it correct or not correct? We don't know because here you may have a zero, you may have a one, right? So we still need to check the fifth bit over there. That's why we consider one, zero, zero, one, and then something else, or don't care next to it. If it is one, still correct. If it is zero, still correct. But at least these ones over there, the one here and the one there, there should be an inside the pattern that we are checking so that we can set this is one, zero, zero, one. I hope this is clear. Uh, if it's not, I can uh, explain it again. Just let me know in the chat box. Okay, let's delete the annotation, move on. Okay, so now the other case is to not have the don't care at the end, but to have it in the beginning, which is as in this. 
So to have this pattern as well, that is also accepted within five input lookup table. So these five inputs will go to the lookup table and the lookup table, for example, here, as you can see highlighted in red, will check these five together and then produce one that is corresponding to the change bit in the middle. So uh, here, let me choose color blue. The thing here, whatever the new value of that bit, only it will be appear in the output. Only that bit, not the other bits. That's why we need overlapping lookup table operation. So you can see lookup table here that consider these set of five bits and so on. And every output of this lookup table corresponds to the change we need to apply to the things in the middle. So if we find here in this pattern, one, zero, one, then the thing in the middle, which is zero, need to be replaced into one. That's why we produce one here. And this is how you got one, one, one in the output. This is how to achieve high parallelism in the FPGA. And by knowing the exact number of input to the lookup table, we achieve very efficient implementation. And then we need many of these lookup table to, in order to produce all the bets of the uh, amended or the change factor as we discussed. Now, how many of these lookup table we need? We need as many as we have in the read uh, or the sequence length. So if we have 100 bits, then we need 100 of these of those lookup table. Uh, I don't see the cursor. Okay. Let me delete the annotation. Hopefully this is clear. This is where we chain the vectors. And now we need and operation uh, to uh, calculate all of these vectors or the final vector. And then we need a counter to count how many ones we have in the final bit vector. And then we do a competitor to compare it with the threshold. And that's all for the implementation. As you can see, all the operation we use are really FPGA friendly, which makes it very suitable for FPGA implementation. And remember, we require five input lookup table FPGAs. So we need to look for the FPGAs that have their lookup table, at least five inputs. It's okay to use seven inputs, for example, but at least five. That's why we use this, is what we call Xilinx uh, Vertex 7 FPGA. Now it's AMD, AMD already acquired Xilinx. And, and the, in their FPGAs, in the Vertex 7 family, you can see uh, a single um, uh, CLP or logic block has two slices. And in a single slice, we have multiple lookup table. Each lookup table has seven input uh, over there. So that makes it, uh, sorry, it has a six input lookup table and you can configure it as a five if you need a two output uh, with this. So uh, that is why we choose this kind of FPGA or this Vertex 7 family in that time in 2016. I think we started the implementation in 2015. And then we get the paper published in 2016, 2017. Um, so yeah, that is for the FPGA implementation. Now for the key results, we uh, implemented or we realized this in real FPGAs. Uh, and we, uh, this is the FPGA itself, Vertex 7. Uh, VC709. It cost about $5,000 to get this in that time. I'm not sure about the price these days. Uh, we do the comparison with adjacency filtering and shifted Hamming distance, the original algorithm. Adjacency filtering is slow, but accept a large number of dissimilar sequences. So uh, both of them are disadvantages for the algorithm since they do false accept, and it's also slow when you do the comparison. And uh, shifted Hamming distance is um, uh, the original algorithm. They don't apply Hamming distance in the beginning, for, for example. So they, they, they lose some of the computation and they lose some of the benefits. That's why they accept uh, more pairs as false positive or false accept. And uh, also the implementation they provide in shifted Hamming distance using SIMD, they use an old implementation of uh, uh, SIMD uh, registers that is limited to 128 bits, um, sorry, 256 bits. That is corresponding to 128 characters. That is the limitation of this filter. So you cannot filter longer sequences than 128 characters. 
These are the resource utilization we have from get implementing Gatekeeper. As you can see, this is for a single problem of length 100 uh, or 300. And you can see at most, <coughs> sorry, the resources are less than 5% of the total resources we have in the FPGA. So uh, that will tell you the amount of parallelism that you can achieve, how many problems you can solve and parallel. And each problem will solve independent two sequences of length 100 or 300, for example. So if we have 5%, ideally you would fit around 50 uh, more or something. Uh, no, sorry, uh, it will fit about um, uh, 20, 20 of these problems together. If you have less than 1%, for example, then you can fit 100 of these replication. That of course, if the, um, the, uh, the um, critical path allows for that, you may want to pipeline these problems together because the maximum delay you can have cannot achieve the maximum frequency you can use in the FPGA. So the critical path in FPGA implementation is very important here uh, so that uh, you can drive a lot of these gates in parallel. Uh, Sometimes you cannot uh, apply the VCC or the ground to a large number of gates. And that's uh, specified or controlled by the total critical path or the worst delay in any of the input signals, for example. So you may need to use pipelining techniques to reduce this critical path, for example, or you reduce the number of replications. These are all challenges uh, when you implement a, a parallelized algorithm in FPGA, or you would like to fully utilize all resources you have in the FPGA. Now, when we do the experiment, this much uh, how we can fit or we can use in the lookup table. Uh, when I was talking about when you have 1% of utilization, you can fit 100 uh, of these replication, that is ideal. But when it comes in practice, you may not be able to fit this many as uh, the challenges I listed just earlier. So at most we can uh, solve 16 problems at that time and eight problems using 300 long sequences. Uh, we didn't use long sequences at that time because in 2016, we don't have any technology that provide longer than 300 long sequences. So ONT was just starting and they provide about 65% accuracy. So nobody was using it at that time. That is for the results, how much we can get in throughput. And this is when we, uh, when we have a screenshot for the FPGA and where the resources you were using for a single problem of length 300 percent, uh, 300 uh, long sequences. Now, these are the results. And again, everything, the FPGA, the C implementation of uh, Gatekeeper are all publicly available during uh, using this GitHub. So feel free to download it, play with it. If you're having some projects for digital design, you can use the code and uh, maybe you can improve it. You can change the operation and so on. Instead of end operation, you could apply something else and come up with your own algorithm, for example. So there is a significant performance gap between high throughput DNA sequencer and read mapper. And sequence alignment is computationally expensive and we cannot avoid it as we all agree. So Gatekeeper was the first hardware accelerator in that time for quickly rejecting the similar sequences. And it provides a huge speed up of up to 130x compared to uh, uh, software solutions. The FPGA pays uh, pre-alignment filtering greatly speed up um, uh, read mapping, uh, providing about 10x of speed up compared to Mr. Fast. It was state of that in that time. Now we have Minimap 2, for example, but we don't know how much speed up compared to that. The FPGA-based pre-alignment filtering can be integrated with existing sequences. So most of existing short read align um, sequencers, they have FPGA inside to do the translation from the row sequencing uh, data into, uh, into the uh, FASTQ file or what we have currently. And that's what we call a base calling step. So you can already, since it has a low footprint, for the FPGA implementation, less than 5%, you can still maybe integrate it with existing FPGA inside the sequencing machine. And these provide two benefits. First, hiding the complexity from the user and do real-time filtering. That's why uh, this is the shifted Hamming distance paper published in bioinformatics. This is Gatekeeper published also in bioinformatics in 2017. Um, 
as the strengths and weaknesses, I will leave it to you to go through the slides and uh, try to fit the uh, strengths and weaknesses. I would like to mention something very important. Um, so these are uh, the paper I mentioned when I started the, the lecture about accelerating genome analysis. So where we have not only pre-alignment filtering, but listing all the works on indexing, seeding, uh, pre-alignment filtering, and sequence alignment. So there are a lot of efforts. And Gatekeeper is around this, which is pigeonhole principle. So this is where Gatekeeper and similar filters are located. There are other methods to be used as a filter, as you can see, and we will also explain them in the next uh, lectures. Now, there are also other efforts from our group on uh, accelerating read mapping, as you can see. Uh, for us, gatekeepers is, uh, can be under this category uh, to replace the CPU with specialized core, but we still suffer from memory bottleneck, for example, problem, or a storage problem, movement, moving the data from the storage all the way to my memory to the FPGA itself. Uh, the key takeaways, uh, we uh, um, propose a novel method to accelerate sequence alignment. That is a new algorithm and new FPGA implementation. Uh, basically, you can consider this as simple and effective algorithm since it rely on a very simple operation supported by most of the hardware accelerators. And the hardware software cooperation or co-design is really important here. So as I uh, said earlier, you need really to understand the hardware so that you design an algorithm suitable for the hardware or aware about the characteristics or the properties of the hardware you are using. And also you need to design an architecture that fits well the algorithm you design. So both of them are very important for getting the best speed up out of it. So this is a good potential for work building on it. And there are a lot of work use, um, use Gatekeeper to extend and build on top of it. We were going through some of them. And, uh, some of them are very recent work, some of them old uh, work. But there are multiple um, uh, related works that build on top of Gatekeeper and find ways to improve the accuracy or the speed up. Now, how about using this in real life? where people should use Gatekeeper in real life. When we submit the paper for the journal, the bioinformatics, we got this review. They said, this, this, is not, um, this is not a problem with the manuscript at all, but this is a major concern from the perspective of the reviewer. He said, there are other works try to accelerate FPJ, but not pre-alignment filtering. There are other accelerations, such as sequence alignment, for example, to be accelerated for 20 or 30 years using FPJs. And mostly these hardware accelerators has not been used until uh, that time, 2016, for improving the speed of alignment. So he said, while there has been uh, considerable work in this area, it doesn't seem that these hardware-based solution have gained any type of real traction in the community. So we answer with very long um, answer and provide examples, but what was important in our answer, is we said, it always takes time to adopt new or different hardware technologies since it requires investment in the hardware infrastructure. So it always take time in order to adapt something new, especially when we talk about hardware. We were a dreamer in that time. And two years later, we got this from real company that do the sequencing called Olomina. They acquire another startup that doing FPJ acceleration for genomics. And then they start to adapt this FPGA solution called Dragon inside the sequencing machine. So it's always great to be the first to propose something that not been used before. And then it will take some time to adapt these solutions. And you can see we have also now uh, solutions from NVIDIA. They start in 2020, the uh, Paraprex uh, solution or the, uh, the pipeline for accelerating multiple step in genome analysis, including read mapping and variant calling. However, in all these solution, computing is still bottlenecked by data movement. Uh, as long as we use GPUs or FPGA, we still need to move data from the main memory to these accelerators. Even if we share the memory, uh, if we have direct access, for example, to the main memory, we still need uh, to spend some effort moving the data between these two accelerators. 
that's why in the next few weeks, we will show you uh, real examples on how we can solve the data movement uh, problem. Uh, I believe all these pointers, we already uh, list them in the previous lecture. So I always recommend people to watch these videos, lecture uh, more papers. We will go through them in the following lecture in the next week. So that was it for gatekeeper paper. Uh, I hope we cover most of the things about Gatekeeper. We will also repeat some of the uh, material covered here in next week's lecture with more examples from other filtering algorithms. We aim by having this lecture is to give you more insights about the things that you can do as a PNS student, where you can implement projects that can be used in real life or real application, or even to be used in the future. You don't know where people will find it beneficial. That's what's it. That was it for today. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, if you have any question, you can ask me or send them over Moodle as usual or over email. Uh, thank you so much. Take care. See you next week.